we now have an opportunity to now explore our experience of one God. And to do so, I invite Reverend Ann Shan to the podium. Please help me to welcome Reverend Ann. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much. I thank Sandra for setting the tone for our morning service. So let me add my own words of welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a wonderful Sunday morning, and also welcome to the persons joining us on the World Wide Web. I have been handed the baton by Reverend John, who spoke last Sunday, to continue the development of our teaching of the science of mind from our textbook, The Science of Mind, the magnum opus of our beloved Dr. Ernest Holmes. Last Sunday, the first four chapters introduced us to the foundation that anchors the fundamentals, the intense purposes and principles of our teaching. Dr. Ernest Holmes described it like this, and I quote, you're about to start on the most interesting quest the human mind has ever made. The discovery of the life principle, the way it works, and your relationship with it. You're about to make the greatest discovery of your life, which is how to use the creative power of your thought for definite purposes, purposes which will benefit you, your family, and your friends. These statements aptly describe the information gleaned from the thing itself, the way it works, what it does, and how to use it. I hope those that have a text read the information. I'm not going to ask anybody to put up their hand. Contemplated it and embodied some aspect of it. But Sandra led us off when she said, what is it that you really want? What is it that you really, really, really want? And the reason for that is that there's a process that works that demonstrates exactly what it is that you really, really want. So my thoughts this morning are centered around some of the aspects from the part one of the book, the nature of being, which is simply what we believe about God and man. Exactly how what we believe will assist us in experiencing the manifestation of our life's goals Reverend Arthur Johnson, the writer of the Daily Guides for this month's Science of Mind magazine, used the acronym God's Opportunity for Abundant Living to describe the goals we set. God's Opportunity for Abundant Living. So how we can use what we know to live abundantly by focusing on what we want. So we go back to the nature of being. Nature the known has a number of meanings. For instance, characteristics, essence, qualities, attributes, features, identity, to name a few. Being, I will use the one from our glossary of the Science of Mind text. And it says, that which exists actually or potentially. When capitalized, being refers to divine being, God. There's one source of being. God, one God, and we are connected with it at all times, end of quote. Part one of the text covers the chapters in the beginning, God. Mind, the greatest discovery, spirit, soul, body, man's relationship to the spiritual universe, and it has a summary. So to look at the nature of being is to discover the attributes of this power, greater than ourselves and our relationship to it. The Judeo-Christian Bible stated, and I quote, so God created man in his own image. Here Field stated in his book, A Metaphysical Interpretation of the Bible, and I read, perhaps God really did make us in its likeness. In the continuing process of our ev evolution, it seems that this divine declaration of, in of intent is still being unfolded. 
as seemingly finite beings, we yet have to absorb the staggering impact of infinity as an experience and not just as an item of intellect. Each of us has the possibility to discern that the power of infinity and the power of self in conjunction with God will and can create all things. The definitive answer is in the union and not the separation between body and soul that may or may not be inculcated in our minds, what we have been taught. So as we use these instructions from our teaching to guide us in the discovery of ourselves with all our attributes, characteristics of the absolute, first cause, God, living spirit almighty, whatever we call God, or in the scientific terms, the non-localized energy field of potential of which we localize and individuate to first awaken ourselves to our spiritual magnificence and secondly, create a world that works for everyone. Dr. Holmes systematically takes us through from God, its self-knowingness and originating power, through our ability to think, Understanding the definition of spirit, body, soul, different aspects of our soul is the way how oh God works through law, our relationship with the universe. But for today, we we'll look at the chapters in the beginning God and the use of our minds in crafting a world that benefits our continuing unfoldment of the reality of our being. In other words, the unfolding of more of ourselves. In that first chapter, Dr. Holmes gave another meaning of the creation story or allegory from the first chapter of Genesis of the Judeo-Christian Bible. In my humble opinion, it is another way to illustrate the, cre the creative process in the individual, which is one of the linchpins of our teaching. Dr. Holmes summarizes it like this. There's a creative power in the universe that manifests itself through imagination, will, and feeling. This creative power makes things out of itself by becoming the thing that it makes. As the creative mind of the universe operates upon itself through its will, imagination, feeling, it creates forms which are subject to it and to its laws, but which have no reality apart from the mind which creates them. God is all there is and there is nothing else but God. This creative mind is the mind that Jesus used and that we may all use for conscious purposes just as soon as we come to the understand how. Sounds a little familiar, right? What does that mean to each and every one? We are all surrounded by this creative intelligence that permeates all space, flowing into and through all forms. So therefore, this intelligence is mirrored in all things and will respond to our thinking. Why? We share this one mind, which Emerson said is common to, common to all. It just is something that can't be changed. But it is the nature of all being, all being, flowers, animals, man, you name it. It's the nature of being, this intelligence that permeates all things. So when we impress our thought upon it, conscious or unconscious, the creative intelligence by the law of mind then makes things out of itself simply by becoming what it makes. Play-Doh is like that, right? You can only make the little figures out of the Play-Doh itself. You can't go from outside of yourself. You have to make the figure out of the play -Doh. Thought becomes things. So by the same principle in our world of affairs, our dominant stream of thought from our mind, because we are all centers of self-knowingness, when we think within and upon ourselves, manifestation takes place in much the same way as at the universal level. We use our will to keep the crucible or the mold in place of the desired stream of thought. 
That is the, what we're thinking. What is it that we really, really want? We keep our focus in ways. It's, um, the reading said work, but yes, it's work to try and keep your mind straight that this is what I want and do not allow anything else to distract you from where you're going, what you want to de um, demonstrate. So yes, the wheel keeps it in mind. Our imagination now is the universal intelligence functioning through us at the level of our understanding of it. In the sense that when you imagine something that you want it, the picture just comes alive with you. And you wonder that, you know, a normal person, basically who have been educated this way or not educated, can come up. All right, think of Henry Ford. I mean, what possessed him to think that you could make a motor car? Where did that come from? He saw himself in this mechanized mode of transportation. And what his, he imagined it. So somehow the knowledge from that infinite intelligence flowed through Henry Ford. It flowed through Juki Chin of, um, what do you call it, um, Juicy Beef. All he wanted was something to eat, and he experimented with, with mints in a package of dough. And look what happened to Juicy Beef. Juicy Beef is in Canada. It all, I mean, it's 50 stories all through Jamaica. He had an idea. He wanted something to eat. But he made his imagination. Something told him, say, okay, all right, this is what, how it's going to go. And this is what I want. I'm going to bake it. And then, voila, party. And everybody using it as some sort of, you know, something out of the ordinary that they have discovered. I see, um, what you call it? Um, the place that makes pizza, pizza, now using it to enfold the pizza thing, the pizza sauce and the stuff inside. It's still, it's still party. And it was started by Jukichi. See? So the imagination helps you. It's as if the thing takes on life within you at the minute you want to desire it. And everything that color it, make it come alive just flows through your consciousness. It's not rocket science, and it is not magic. It's just straightforward, right? So there is a place within us where we operate from the universal. That is why we can get information from all over and use, right? In it, we live, move, and have our being. So with feeling, when we sense our union with universal power, we are able to affirm the presence of good in our lives, and it manifests in our physical experiences in a myriad of forms, whether it's the car, the this, the that, that is what happens, right? Or whether you want courage or strength or understanding. So with the knowledge that the mind of God is our mind, we bring into form that which already is, because all of it is out there. The idea of electricity existed, but Thomas Edison with his experiments brought it into form for us to utilize in the ways that we have chosen. We, we have fun to say that you can either cook yourself or you can cook your food, right? Same electricity. He brought it into form in a sense. It channeled itself through him. So. Our desired good is actually the intelligence within, seeking to manifest some good through our lives. So we are the channel through which this intelligence breeds life into the desired good that you want, what you really, really want. You are the channel through which it comes. And if you block it off, guess what? Because it is there in the creative intelligence that we are all surrounded by, somebody pick it up somewhere and go on with the idea. See? So the ideas are there. You have to make, if you say you want it, you have to streamline yourself to demonstrate it. That makes sense? All right. So we have to break loose from the bonds of conditioning that would seek to limit expansion of consciousness, fear or any other control, and to simply just contemplate that by the nature of our being, that which is within the invisible flows from the unbounded limitlessness out of which all things emerge. We must learn to think, be from that which is infinite. The Israeli states nurture great thoughts 
for you will never go higher than your thoughts. Therefore, as we experience the evidence or demonstrate our thought life, we acquire knowledge and wisdom which must lead us to experience more of our attributes and abilities. If you don't use it, what happens? You're going to lose it. So you use it so you can expand and stretch like an elastic band. Woo, woo. Infinity. So no matter what happens, it must be viewed as an experience and must ultimately benefit our evolution upwards and onwards. So no matter what happens, it is still an experience, though it's uncomfortable, though it's nice, though it's successful, but it is still an experience and it is there to give you more knowledge to use to expand even more of the same. Everything will always balance out for our highest good. Good is all there is and we must have it. That saying, that saying came from Emma Curtis Hopkins. Good is all there is and we must have it. So our textbook on page 390 reminds us the mind of man is some part of the mind of God. Therefore, it contains within itself unlimited possibility of expansion and self-expression. So as we continue to recognize and accept this truth and work in conjunction with the law of mind, we can position ourselves in the flow of life and experience its limitlessness in the manifest reality of our lives. Again, we have to move beyond the boxes, the barriers, and the limitations that say we're too old, we're too fat, we're too slim, we're too this. That we have accepted as normal. It don't go so. As Harefield states, when we have purged the dross, the things that stop us and limit us, the emergence of the gift of higher spiritual consciousness now flows through us. Our int intuitional capacity is now awakened we are in direct connection with all that is. We live from a higher vibration because our thoughts, words, and actions are now on a higher vibrational level. And the reality of infinite possibilities we must awaken to. Two plus two, right? And not 222, but two plus two. As we discover this, through the power of our thought, we can use our mental abilities beneficially and appropriately and experience true freedom on all levels of our conscious awareness. Dr. Holmes tells this story in support of divine givingness and its infinite propensity that ushers only good in our lives, ultimately. John of, uh, it's not Reverend John this time, a 45-year-old man came to him on the advice of his doctor for years, he had suffered from many physical complaints, to name a few, high blood pressure, ulcers, and nervous tension. In speaking of his spiritual life, he informed that he had not been inside a church since he was a young man. However, he practically demanded that his wife and children attend, although he would wait outside. In asking his reason for not attending church, he replied to Dr. Holmes, it makes me sick. Maybe it's the crowds I don't like, but I do get nervous and my head aches. Dr. Holmes responded, but you said you have not been in a church since you were a young man. John answered, I have tried twice, and I can figure it twice, when he got married, probably. So in response to questions posed by Dr. Holmes, John re revealed even more nervousness, and there seemed to be some mental conflict, fear, and in insecurity expressed in his demeanor as the conversation continued. However, Dr. Holmes noted that John revealed some stability in another era of his life, as he was still employed to the same company for the last 15 years. However, there was a looming fear of another operation for ulcers, and already a large part of his stomach had been removed previously. Something had to be done if he was to retain his position and take care of the family he obviously loved. Dr. Holmes asked to pray with him. John said, no, 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 no. Prayer has the same effect on him as attending church. Yeah. At least he's consistent, though. 
His nervousness increased as Dr. Holmes asked him if he felt that somehow God was condemning him for something that happened in the past. Very intuitive of Dr. Holmes. The man went quite pale with perspiration appearing on his forehead. For his forehead. He shouted, I just can't tell you. But after some thought, he burst out, I must. So the story unfolded that after a fight at age 18, with some man who was seeing his mother, his father had died previously, he decided to leave home. After the fight, his mother refused to stop seeing the man and stated she was going to marry him. John then stole money from his company. He hiked to another town, traveled by bus to the town that he had now settled, the one that he was seeing, Dr. Holmes. Trembling, he said to Dr. Holmes, now do you understand why I can't go to church or even pray? Dr. Holmes asked about communication with his mother. He answered that he had discontinued even trying to write as he felt that the police was watching his mother's mail. Dr. Holmes felt that yes, this man had truly condemned himself. But by starting to talk about it, the step towards release from guilt and fear began. They prayed together and John found peace. A letter was dispatched to his mother, and the long and short of it was that the mother had married the gentleman in question. And when the loss of the money was revealed, the same gentleman who John did not like volunteered to replace the money, and so no criminal charges was ever laid against him. Interesting story. But the lesson is that somehow, that divine beneficence that is within each one of us is omnipresent for all of us, and it continues to perfect what concerns us. Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his air heavy, that he cannot hear. End of quote. So the thoughts of a sincere man availeth much. The fact that he loved his family, that he continued with his life, that the divine beneficence behind the scenes was busy sorting out the things that needed to be sorted out. But he wasn't ready for the information yet until he had gone through the process of revealing it, being in prayer, and then he heard the truth that, in fact, he was the only person who was condemning himself. Nobody else, because the charges were never, ever laid against him. That's living in the flow of life. Bach reminds us that we are distinctive and individual expressions of a creative force. He says you are not a blueprint or a carbon copy or ditto of anyone past, present, or future. You are you, and there is no one quite like you in the world. That which makes you is personal, unique, and exclusive, all of this is a reflection of a world and a life within." End of quote. So how do we ensure we operate at the highest vibration of our good? One, think thoughts of success spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Be from a state of success. As Sanjo said, act it. Everybody has an idea of success, what it means, what it feels. Act what it is that you feel means to be successful. Stay true to that inner light of truth within. Go within for all things. As Clive Thompson said, if you don't go within, you don't eat. You don't have anything. So go within for all things. Focus on happiness, joy, well-being, the deepening of our self-awareness, that which is interesting, beneficial towards growth or growth and unfoldment. Spend time learning and discovering the attributes and characteristics of our true being. That which enhances life, reveal love, promotes our inner wisdom and intuition, stay empowered by living enthusiastically. Nurture the well of peace within, always refresh from that inner sanctuary of tranquility. Know with conviction that the order of the universe is already established within us. Whether or not the outside look like it is not the point. The fact is that the order of the universe is already established in. 
Therefore, the beauty of divine spontaneous react, right action must take place in our lives. Everything ultimately must balance out for our good. And the last part of it says, which I like, experience life with a joyful spirit. Experience life with a joyful spirit. So as we continue to develop that intimate relationship with the all-powerful originating spirit within, we learn to believe in our own potential to expand beyond the boundaries which we have unintentionally set. We learn to live life totally unbounded in the effortless flow of abundance. We must be purpose-driven, the purpose to experience limitlessness because we are equipped with the talents, attributes, and characteristics of infinite spirit. We must achieve self-realization. God in me as me is me. So let us all be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And I end with the words of Meister Eckhart. To get to the core of God at his greatest, one must first get to the core of himself at the least. For no one can know God who has not first known himself. Go to the depths of the soul, the secret place of the Most High, to the roots, to the heights, for all that God can do is focused there. So friends, self-discovery is key. Namaste.